All right, hello everyone, and welcome to our Clean Water Wednesday webinar. Um, we're really excited to be able to offer these webinars to monitors, our clean water community, and our friends to keep everyone connected um, during these strange times. I'm Rebecca Shore. I'm the Save Our Streams Coordinator for the Mid-Atlantic for the Isaac Walton League. And I have a few quick housekeeping items before I hand things over to Caroline. Uh, first, this webinar is being recorded. It'll be available on the Isaac Walton League YouTube channel soon, and you'll get a link to that in your follow-up email. And keep an eye on our website, iwla.org, for our upcoming webinars. We have one more for June coming up next week, and then we'll probably be doing once a month webinars um, going into the future. But definitely keep an eye on our homepage, and that's where we'll be updating with reg registration links and whatnot. Um, if you want to ask questions throughout the webinar, we'll be doing a at the end, and you can submit questions using the questions pane um, in your GoToWebinar control panel. So feel free to send those throughout the presentation, and we'll um, read them aloud and answer them at the end. The GoToWebinar is not like Zoom with an open chat box, so you won't be able to see other folks' chats, um, but you will be able to submit questions still, and we'll be sure to read those aloud. Um, the webinar should be about an hour. Um, and we'll have time, as I said, for Q&A at the end. So if you can, if you want to stay a little bit longer or leave a little bit earlier, no worries. Um, as I said, we're recording. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Caroline Nickerson, who is the program manager at SciStarter, and she's going to walk us through the value of citizen science. Oh my gosh, my favorite topic. Um, thank you so much to Rebecca and to the Save Our Streams team for um, inviting me today and thank you to all of you for being here um, and for caring about this. I think um, it's really important and I have a feeling that a lot of the people on the line might be more practitioner folk like people who have been working in citizen science for a while but all are welcome. I think no matter who you are you're able to get something out of this and um, able to think deeply about and engage with this question about the value of citizen science and why we do it. So I'm going to go to my next slide. So that's me. Um, I wanted to see how many SciStarter robots I could get into one picture. Um, actually, funny story. I did a webinar with some Girl Scouts recently. And as a fun competition, I had them count the number of robots in this picture. Um, there was no prize, just pride. Um, I won't do that to you all. But um, so I'm Caroline Nickerson. Feel free to tag me on Twitter at CH Nickerson if you have any thoughts, comments, questions throughout this webinar. Um, of course, engage in the um, in the webinar room as well, but I'm always happy to take the conversation on Twitter and engage with you all there. Um, and always happy to be a resource for all of your citizen science needs. Um, so you might be wondering why we're here, right? Well, the crux of it is citizen science data. So um, it's about the accuracy, the credibility, and the benefits of it. So what does it mean for data to be accurate, right? It means uh, the data is precise. So it means that um, when people are making a classification, it has the same protocols are, um, for example, like with a health related project like stall catchers, the data is either stalled or flowing. So that was, that's what it means for the data to be accurate. You classify a stalled blood vessel as stalled and a flowing blood, ves blood vessel is flowing. And that's for an Alzheimer's research project. But what does it mean for data to be credible? That's a really deep question, right? It means that we're actually measuring what we think we're measuring. So for a project like um, stream selfie, it would mean that we are measuring the health of streams by taking our observations and contributing our data to that project. Um, data is valuable in so much as it helps us understand the world better, and it's, it's an indicator for what we're trying to grasp about a given problem. And that's the main benefit of it, right? Why do we collect citizen science data? Why do we do data analysis at all? It's because we want to understand something. We want to come up with a solution to a problem. So just really quickly, for those of you who aren't familiar with SciStarter, I wanted to give you kind of um, why we do citizen science, a quick um, overview of our mission, um, so you understand a little bit more about how I'm approaching these questions. So millions of people enjoy science and nature, right? I'm sure many of you on the line also enjoy science and nature. And thousands of scientists need volunteers. Think about the amazing Save Our Streams team and the Isaac Walton League. They need volunteers to do those projects. The projects are so much more powerful when we have the public involved and in making a difference with their passion for science and nature. But the crux of the matter is for citizen science projects, for all those scientists 
and all those people who are passionate, we want them to be able to find each other. So that's where SciStarter comes in. We connect them. So um, the awesome Save Our Streams team, they already have an amazing community, right? But um, at SciStarter, we really want to bring more people in who might not have heard about it otherwise. So like with the Girl Scouts program, we tell them to do the stream selfie project. Our, um, with our um, corporate volunteer programs, we tell them about um, all the different um, projects that Save Our Streams has to offer, and we say, hey, get involved, do this. Um, our main goal at SciStarter is to be that connector, to get even more people involved in citizen science than there would be otherwise. So what is citizen science, right? We like to think of it as a collaboration, as a relationship between scientists and those of us who are curious, concerned, and motivated to make a difference. And I myself am a citizen scientist. Um, I got involved with citizen science not because I had a STEM degree in undergrad, it's because I wanted to learn more about butterflies. I started getting involved in a research project and before I knew it, I was doing citizen science. Um, so citizen science, the crux of it is that relationship and that volunteer work between um, the um, general public that wants to make a difference and the science projects that need their help to go to the next mile and really accomplish something. And um, I just wanted to reiterate that citizen science is serious science. Because of citizen scientists, we know things that we wouldn't know otherwise. We know that birds are breeding earlier. We know about bacteria that live in your belly button. Citizen scientists have helped discover planets. Um, they help um, identify you know, invasive species um, and their geographic distribution. And of course, I mean, migratory birds and climate change, we wouldn't understand half of what we know without the work of citizen scientists. So they're really important. And at SciStarter, I mentioned we, play, we try to play that connector role. We also try to think um, deeply about these questions about the value of citizen science, um, whether it really is an effective tool to learn more about the world, um, the right protocols to do that. Like, are there best practices different projects could use to um, make more of a difference? Um, and that's why I felt um, so excited when Rebecca invited me to come on today and chat with you all. Um, because these are questions that, you know, I think about every day and that I really want to engage in dialogue with like awesome people like the Save Our Streams team and with all of you to help us understand it better because it's an evolving process, right? All of this is um, an experiment. Citizen science is as broad as science itself. It's everything from astronomy to zoology and everything in between. And because of that, there's no one way to approach these questions because it is so broad. Um, and where I'm looking forward to being engaged in these conversations throughout the rest of my career. So I mentioned at SciStarter, we think citizen science is for everyone, um, anyone who wants to make a difference. And we connect people to over 3,000 citizen science projects, tools, and events. So that's the crux of it. So um, now, now I'm going to kind of speak to the practitioner community a little bit. So you may be thinking, how can I make sure that the data um, that I that volunteers are collecting for my project, how can I make sure that it's valid, it's accurate, it's credible? Well, one big thing you can do is design. Designing citizen science, if there's one thing you take away from what I'm saying today, it's that design matters. So I really recommend, um, for those of you who are interested in this field, reading the National Academies report, learning through citizen science, enhancing opportunities by design, because um, one major finding from this report was that when citizen science projects um, are designed for learning, so when they try to um, uh, help participants learn something more about science and the scientific method or about the topic area, it actually helps enhance the outcomes and enables more scientific discovery. So you really need to be intentional when you're putting together a citizen science project for all sorts of things, for data quality, and for participant learning. There are so many different things you can embed in your project design to make your project better. Um, so common features of citizen science. I just wanted to go over this. Um, I mean, not every citizen science is different. Not all of them um, have all these characteristics, but these are kind of our go-tos at SciStarter for what makes a really good citizen science project. So number one, anyone can participate. We think that's key. We don't think you should have, a, for a project to be a citizen science project, Folks shouldn't have to have any special training um, ahead of time. They shouldn't have to have even, you know, gone to college or graduated high school. It could be anyone with any background. We want them to be able to plug in and be part of that project. Um, number two, we want um, really clear processes and protocols for people to make observations, to collect, share, and analyze data. So there should be no ambiguity for participants about 
the steps they need to follow to participate in the project. That's what makes it a good citizen science project. And when folks do that, that means that the data can advance research and support decision making. Clear protocols, clarity, good design results in data that can be trusted. And ideally, um, the best of the best projects, the data is open. Anyone can have access to and use it um, to draw new insights about the world. Oh no, I went, for, I went too far. Let me go back. One second. So advantages. So why do citizen science, right? Why not just do your, have a research project where you're in the lab and you're doing analysis? Well, a big part of this is citizen science helps bridge gaps. Um, so they harness the power of the people. And this is really powerful. Um, one project that comes to mind that does this is Crowd the Tap. Um, it's a project where folks um, basically just use a penny and a magnet um, to do a simple at-home test to contribute to a national inventory of water pipes. Um, and they're trying to determine whether or not you know, their pipes are lead. Um, and this is huge. The Crowd the Tap project, they wouldn't be able to do this really important research about citizen engagement, because otherwise they'd have to go door to door, knock on people's doors, ask them, hey, do you want to participate in my project? Um, by letting people opt in, they can go so much further than they could just by themselves. Um, and that kind of gets to the scope um, part of it. Um, so public participation makes new things possible. You know, it bridges gaps. It, makes, um, it takes people from the lab to the home and everywhere in between. It also allows projects to go further than they would otherwise. And ultimately, they could result in policy. Um, I can't wait to see what the Crowd the Tap project discovers um, when they're making their national inventory of water pipes because um, decision makers, you know, either leaders in government or just um, leaders in the community, maybe could um, design policy interventions to make the world a better place based on what Crowd the Tap discovers. We don't, we don't know yet. Um, and it's also just good for folks um, when projects are designed for learning. Um, when citizen scientists engage in this, and I count myself in this audience as a citizen scientist, I'm able to be a more informed citizen, um, a more informed citizen of the world, um, and I'm able to uh, engage more meaningfully with the scientific enterprise, and it, it just enhances my life. So I think all of these are key advantages of citizen science. Um, so that being said, like I said, design is key. Um, not every observation you're going to get um, for a citizen science project is going to be a quality observation. Um, maybe someone will make a mistake. I mean, that's just part of life. Um, maybe they'll try to take a stream selfie, but they'll accidentally take a picture of their foot and submit it. Um, that sounds silly, but things like this do happen. I bet you Rebecca can confirm um, from her side of things about every once in a while, maybe not the best observations come through. Um, and that's why, of course, the clear instructions, the clear protocols really help. And having multiple individuals classifying, so having a bigger data set. Um, uh, that being said, the most common mechanism for data validation is expert review followed by photo submission. So literally just going through it and checking things out. Um, and the main categories of error that um, folks tend to see are with the protocols, so unclear instructions leading to um, uh, not as useful submissions, and errors on the participant side. So it could be either an error in design are an error in submission. Um, and we mentioned with the project design, there are certain, there are clever interventions you can have to um, help folks um, submit high quality observations. So um, one example that I found really compelling, this is from a paper that just came out this year, was just in time training. So instead of, you know, giving people a bunch of instructions up front and saying, don't forget to do X and classify Y, and you're looking at this camera trap footage, you know, blah, 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 they um, gave the volunteers on-demand resources to train them um, on the spot or in, in conjunction with the research they were performing in the moment. And this really helped with accuracy. It took the, um, the contributions up to a really high quality level. Um, so that's an example, I think, of clever project design. Um, you're helping the participants succeed. And uh, I thought this was funny um, that Oh no, that's on my next slide. There's a funny, there's a funny slide coming up. But for this one, it, um, it's also clear that some of the things we're worried about with data quality, that's true for projects that don't involve citizen scientists as well. Um, so you know, if you are worried about data quality, you should be worried about it for all science because I think citizen science and um, ha suffers from some of the same issues that regular science has with data quality. Um, and many studies have found that. 
the data issues are um, somewhat um, the same with professional data. So um, with uh, in terms of quality data um, and matching up. But um, another technique that I found in my literature review about this is that um, some other methods that enhance the quality of data collected by citizen scientists are when participants are involved for longer time periods, um, when participants have training ahead of time, when it's a larger group, I mean, increasing that sample size, that really helps um, ensure high quality data. And um, when participants, I thought this was interesting as well, when they're submitting data about themselves, so about their own economic and health situations, that of course helps with accuracy as well. So different projects will re um, require different design interventions. Um, but I really don't think if you want to explore um, designing your citizen science project, I don't think you should be worried about data quality because um, many studies find that, you know, when designed properly, citizen science projects have data that's of equal quality to professional data. Um, so here's another example I thought of a clever intervention, Project Feeder Watch. So that's a project that, you know, how you saw on the last slide, that projects where people are involved for a long period of time tend to be a little bit more accurate. Project Feeder Watch is one of those projects where they ask people to, over the winter season, monitor their backyard feeders for birds over a longer period of time. But um, on the um, project side of things, they use smart filters. So they would flag an observation if it hadn't been reported by at least 4% of the participants in the state or province prior to a particular surveying season. Um, so I thought that was really smart. You know, they're trying to, they know that like, of course, these um, observations could be possible, right? Maybe the species might pop up, but it's kind of unlikely. So they had the smart filter system to help them flag it to take a closer look. And that's kind of an example of working smarter and not harder on the um, data quality side of things. Another project, stall catchers. So I mentioned earlier that citizen science is everything from astronomy to zoology. Well, stall catchers is right in the middle there. It's a health project. It's Alzheimer's research. And I think one really cool design um, and design um, in innovation that they have is that multiple volunteers make their classifications and there are also machine learning techniques to kind of help verify um, these classifications. So the machine can't do it on its own, right? People are still needed to make these classifications of blood vessels for Alzheimer's research. But um, the machine learning can be like a helpful check, kind of like what Project Feeder Watch had um, to uh, verify that the data is high quality, that the um, it, that's an accurate annotation by the volunteer, um, and multiple volunteers help with that too. So we're leveraging the power of the crowd there for good data. Um, and this is the funny one. I thought um, this is from a case study of an invasive species case study. Um, I, I really like this sentence. We generally found that the volunteers perform almost as well as professionals in some areas. But that we should be cautious about data quality in both groups. It's like, yeah, worry about the professionals too. We should be careful about everything, not just citizen science. So I, I thought that was a good thing to keep in mind as we kind of tackle this field. Um, and of course, um, we're here um, with the Save Our Streams team. So I got to talk about water. Water quality data is so, so important. Um, I thought this was a really interesting project, the Texas Stream Team. Um, so they had a citizen science program, um, and for this particular case study, they looked at um, data from 1992 to 2016, and they compared the citizen science data to professional data from corresponding stations. And they found that um, with researcher supervision, these data sets were about equally accurate. So um, this particular water quality project, because it was designed well, the citizen science program had researchers supervising things, um, and helping them succeed, helping the citizen scientists succeed, um, it, meant, it meant that this data set was reliable. And the whole value of having citizen scientists involved is the data set was able to be larger than it would be otherwise with just the professional station. Um, so it showed that um, citizen scientists brought a lot of value to the scientific research and water management program. Um, and they were in part able to do that because um, the Texas Stream Team designed it for success. Um, by having some researcher supervision. Um, and I'll send this link to Rebecca for the follow-up, but I thought the Wilson Center did a really great list of um, uh, an annotated bibliography of data quality in citizen science. And it looks like it was updated pretty recently. I enjoyed reading through it while I was preparing for this webinar. And um, just to kind of conclude, um, before I hand it over to Rebecca to talk about 
the projects that the, the Save Our Streams team did. Um, from my perspective at SciStarter, you know, we do a lot of program management, getting folks involved in different projects, working with projects um, on different programs. Um, I really think the projects that succeed are the ones that are thoughtful and willing to go the extra mile for participants to have a good experience. So you saw on one of my first slides about the National Academies report, they found that when you design for participant learning, when you want the participants to have a good experience, um, that it enhances scientific discovery, right? And um, designing for data quality can do that too. It's um, giving clear instructions, um, making sure the participants know what to do and there's no confusion for them, that, which would be a very unpleasant experience. You don't want them to be confused. When you're thoughtful about your participants and you view them as partners and um, when you respect them, then you can really succeed um, with citizen science and you'll get some high quality data and learn new things about the world. Um, so with that, I'm gonna wrap it up here. And I just wanted to um, thank it to Rebecca. I wanted to thank Rebecca. I wanted to leave it with plenty of time for questions. So there we go. All right, great. Let me just uh, flip this over to my screen here. And yeah, if folks have questions and, um, you know, as Caroline mentioned, we have, you know, plenty of time for discussion, especially, especially Caroline works with all different kinds of um, groups and projects. So if you're interested in, you know, more specific questions, definitely feel free to send those along. I'm just going to make sure this all lines up here. Alrighty, perfect. Yes, stream selfie, my favorite. Got to start with stream selfie. So what I'm just going to do is go through some of our particular, um, oh, here I am, um, some of our particular projects that we have through Save Our Streams and the Isaac Walton League and sort of the different levels of participation that they allow for, um, for to engage citizen scientists. And one of the things that is really valuable about our different programs is that we have our ladder of engagement, we call it, and it's a way to engage folks at all different levels who might not necessarily be ready to jump right into doing um, biological stream monitoring, but want to start getting engaged with their local streams and with clean water. So it's a really, it might give you some ideas also about what are some ways that you can either plug into these programs or develop your own smaller programs that allow you to grab people sort of where they are and help, as Caroline said, help educate them, help them learn, and then also get them engaged in these um, many different topics. There's, of course, a wide range of citizen science potential out there in terms of things that folks can do. And something that Caroline mentioned um, about the data validity is that we have our Save Our Streams program, particular in Virginia. We have a Virginia Save Our Streams program, which has a specific protocol that's just for the Chesapeake watershed region. And that had a data validation study um, through Virginia Tech that showed the extremely high correlation um, over 90% between professionals and um, volunteer data collected. So volunteer data is great data, it's really usable. Um, and as Caroline mentioned, a lot of it comes down to helping folks make sure things are clear and um, giving them lots of opportunity to, to practice and get familiar. So our first program I'm going to talk about is Stream Selfie, and this is our program that uh, we have in very close partnership with SciStarter, so it's hosted on SciStarter, and this is a program, um, my other screen is over here, I don't want folks to think that I'm ignoring you, I'm just looking at my other monitor, um, and so this is a program where um, folks can basically go out to their favorite local stream or if they're you know, on vacation and traveling, once we're able to do that again, um, snap a picture with your favorite stream and then you fill out a few questions, submit it and it becomes part of our national database. And so this year, um, let me just doop -doo -doo, go on here. So for example, these are all the sites that were submitted just in 2020. Um, we've had submissions from 49 out of 50 states. Um, one of my, our communications person asked me, she said, if you get one from Alaska, let me know. Um, so if anyone's listening in Alaska, go get a stream selfie. Um, but so initially the, the base level of this program is just to have people engage with their local streams and just go out and show us where people are recreating, um, where are these streams that we care about. You know, a lot of us 
really like um, being out near it, being out in nature and being out near streams. And it's just a chance to go out and sort of a fuzzy feel good opportunity to share. You know, this is what my favorite stream looks like. Um, but we also ask some particular data questions and we're starting to use that data um, to help educate folks about various water quality issues. So for example, um, a, a few months ago, we put together this map, which is our trash map. And when folks are filling out information about their stream, you know, they say the name of their stream, um, where they are, it pulls their GPS location from their phone, but you can also report on things like the amount of trash. And so what we started to do is pull together these maps where you can see in this image, green is for not very much, yellow is moderate, orange is lots, and then red is, well, I guess orange is sort of medium, and then red is lots of trash. And not shockingly, a lot of these red points are in the more urban areas, the more developed areas. But one of the things you want to do is not only does this give folks an opportunity to say, look at a map and say, oh, this is somewhere I could go and do a stream cleanup and make a real impact right away. It's also a way to help people who are taking the selfies start to cue into what's going on in the stream around them. So another question we ask is, does the stream flow year round? And I just um, have started putting together a map and writing up some a blog and some guidance about this because that's a really important question for water quality and especially water quality protections. So if a stream doesn't flow year round, it might not get the same water quality protections that a continuous stream does. And there was recent change in legislation about this. Um, and so this is something where you might not think about it when you're out you know, going out and recreating or going on your favorite hike and you see a little mountain spring, this is something you can start to think about. Does this stream flow year round? And if it doesn't, that can have implications for clean water. So it's a really nice program because it's basically a, a bottom level way to start just thinking about clean water, thinking about streams, what are, what are the different things impacting your stream? And also gives us some great crowdsource data. Um, this is one of our most popular programs, especially with the uh, scouts. So we get lots of Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts sending in their submissions, but we get folks from all walks of life, um, you know, sending in selfies when they're out on hikes. We've been getting a lot of them, of course, with folks wearing their masks when they're out social distancing. So it's been really interesting and it kind of keeps us all engaged with our community, even when we might not be able to monitor um, in, a, in a more rigorous way. Our next program that I want to talk about is our Winter Salt Watch program, and this one has gotten very popular. Um, it's only, we just finished our third year of it, and it's a program that's basically going out to uh, measure the chloride levels in local streams. And we particularly target in the, in the winter because that's, of course, when road salt is being applied, so this is a year-round issue. And this is a program where folks go online, they request a free salt watch kit, we mail it out to them. You can see there are these um, postcards that have these very clear instructions. They get four strips, clear instructions how to do it. Um, and then they send in just a picture of that full card. And that way we can verify their readings, um, but also it gives us great pictures. Again, a lot of this is also to get a lot of great media to be able to share with you know, other folks who, you know, to show that we've got lots of people out in the field. They're really excited, they're really engaged. Um, collecting a lot of photos is good to help support your own program and also share with other people. Um, you know, you're part of a community. So Winter Salt Watch, as I said, we just finished up our third year and we had over 750 reports. Um, so it's grown quite a lot. And this has almost entirely been organic growth. Um, we are looking to, you know, start doing increasing campaigns about it, but we had some concentrated areas. So like you can see around the Philadelphia region, um, and DC, where our headquarters are, of course, there's been a lot of um, popularity in the program there. But even just in this map, um, you can see, again, green, yellow, orange, red, showing sort of the range of where safe versus toxic to aquatic life levels, um, levels of chloride are coming in. And it's, it's resulted in some really great partnerships um, with some local watershed groups. Um, our favorite group to shout out is the um, Penny Pack Ecological Restoration Trust um, outside of Philly. They're a group who has taken Salt Watch, they mobilized their volunteers, and now they're working to do outreach campaigns to start promoting different behavior changes in road salt applications. So working with businesses, working with landowners to say, 
if you put down so much salt that it's crunching beneath your feet, that's too much. Um, you can sweep it up and reuse it. And that salt has a huge effect on our water quality. So this has been a really great program. Again, it's only our third year and we're getting tons of great results. Um, and we're really starting to see it expand into um, the Midwest. And of course, there are other areas where we're not gonna get readings from, say, Florida. Um, sorry, Caroline. Or some of the areas that might not be applying red salt. Um, but this is just another example of something that grew really organically. And it's really um, tangible. It's something that folks can really key in on in terms of, oh, I've seen salt trucks put salt down on the road, but I never thought about what happens to it. Um, turns out it goes into our streams. So this has been um, another program of ours that's really taken off. And the last one to highlight, um, oh no, second to last one, uh, is our Save Our Streams program. So this is sort of our flagship um, citizen science program. This is either chemical or biological monitoring, and it requires a little more rigorous training. So this isn't something like Salt Watch or Stream Selfie, where you can go out on your own and do it. This requires training. Um, so we actually just launched, um, we just wrapped up for the first time online training. So we have presentations. There is also field training for biological um, that's required. And so this program is a great way to really get very valuable citizen science data that is used um, by state agencies, federal agencies. Um, the data is quality assured by staff. So this is our more, most rigorous um, program. And uh, I mentioned our, our Virginia Save Our Streams program specifically. Um, that's one where the state of Virginia uses that data in their biannual re federal reports. So it's really valuable. Um, you can see on the left is our biological monitoring, and that's where folks go into the stream and they're collecting macroinvertebrates, which are the small bugs um, that live in the stream, and they then identify the bugs, tally them up, and that can tell you how healthy your stream is. And on the right, that's one of our chemical um, monitoring kits. I think that's dissolved oxygen. And so the chem kits are great because you can become a chemical monitor and actually you get those kits and they have the instructions provided. Um, so that actually doesn't require the training that the biological does. But that chemical data, again, is really great because it can show over time what might be some things affecting your waterways. And the last one I just want to highlight, we're really excited about, oh, here we go, sorry. So this is our um, clean water hub. So this is where that data goes. So the Save Our Streams data goes into our clean water hub, which is our public database. You can visit it, cleanwaterhub.org. And um, this is where you can see all of our samples for both chemical and biological data. And a really important thing, um, which Caroline also mentioned, is making this data available. So our Save Our Streams data is publicly available to anyone. You can go in, you can look at individual sites, you can you know see if there's one near you how it's doing you upload your data that way um, and our goal is to have basically there's tons of water quality data being collected uh, for example in iowa you'll see it's really dense there that's actually historical data that we inherited um, from another program and we want to make sure that data is available to everyone so it's a great way to say you know our waterways are all connected they belong to all of us and here's what's going on in them so um as we continue to grow the Save Our Streams program, um, you'll hopefully be able to see more and more dots. And we're also incorporated other protocols and other programs into this database. So it'll be all kinds of information, including creek critters. So that was the last thing I wanted to highlight. Um, creek critters, especially in this time where we're not able to yet hold in-person training. So I mentioned for biological monitoring, that requires some in-person training. Um, we can't host those yet, uh, but this is a great app and program that allows you to go out in the stream, start looking for bugs um, right away and learning how to identify them and submit that data. Um, so this app, we relaunched with our partners at the Audubon Natural Society. And well, all you need is a smartphone. You can go out into the field and you, have, you can bring a net, a small pan, um, something to sort the bugs with. You can even just go out and turn over rocks um, and see what's underneath. And then using this app, it walks you through the protocol very easily. It helps you identify them. And then you can submit that data and it's actually going to go into that database I was just talking about. So this is something that we're excited about. It's sort of 
oddly timely <laughs> that this came out um, during this time when we can't host trainings. So this is definitely a really fun app, um, which we're promoting to folks as a way to get out, learn what's going on in your stream, see how that relates to water quality, and actually send in some helpful data. And as with all these programs, we sort of want folks to kind of catch the bug in terms of, um, pun, pun mostly intended, um, of water quality and start to get interested and see there's all these different ways you can plug into helping us find out what's going on in our waterways and also contribute real usable data. Um, so that's sort of a whirlwind tour um, of all of our all of our different programs that we have. Um, yeah, you can definitely send me an email. We'll also send in the follow-up information about all these different programs um, if you'd like to get engaged. And um, as I mentioned, of course, Stream Selfie is our SciStarter partner program, but all these other ones you can find out about on our website, um, just at iwla.org slash water. Um, and yeah, so with that, I wanna make sure we have some time to open up for questions. So I know there's folks who are from all over the area, all over the country, um, who are involved with um, citizen science. And so let me just, I'll just leave this. I'll just leave this screen up here for everyone to enjoy this lovely picture of water. I, love, I like the picture, it's beautiful. Thank you. I actually have a question to kick us off if you're okay. Yeah, so, yeah. super, yes. I, when I saw you presenting about creek critters, um, I haven't had a chance to download the app yet, but now I'm really excited to. And I was wondering, so, with citizen science, like our number one way for it to be valuable is for clear instructions, right? That way people know what data they're supposed to be submitting. And um, it's accurate data, it's credible data, and it benefits everybody. So I was wondering when you all were designing the Creek Critters app, how did you um, kind of conceptualize the instructions there? And what do you think helped make those instructions useful for citizen science and data? Yeah, so I do want to give a really big shout out to our partners at ANS. So they're the ones who really put together the protocol and especially these graphics and sort of what the step by step step by step instructions are um, for for folks who want to download this. Um, but I think one of the key things, of course, if you're not able to um, you know have a video or do a training in person, is to have right these like really nice graphics and really clear instructions and also not you want to avoid overwhelming people with too much information, right? So when we do our full Save Our Streams training, we talk about what are benthic aquatic macroinvertebrates? Um, what are the, what is their life cycle? What are all these different things? And there's a lot of really in-depth information you can get into very quickly, very quickly about bugs. Um, but I think one of the key things about an app like this is that you want to engage people without turning them off and making them feel like I can't do this. This is for someone who's trained, um, you know, a trained scientist a true, who has a PhD and has been studying bugs forever. Um, I can tell you, I didn't, you know, I didn't study bugs <laughs> in college. So it's intimidating to start. So I think that's one of the keys is, you know, even with the instructions you can see here, like find the tiny critters. We're not gonna go into like, what are insects and what are crustaceans and all this stuff, you know, what are ways that you can help cue people in on things they're familiar with, teach them, um, but also make sure that they understand that this is not something that you should be afraid of. Um, and it's, you know, a nice thing with the update is that we have lots more visuals and videos of the bugs. Um, and the thing about this data is that different from our Save Our Streams data, which is, uh, you know, much higher quality, you have to pass um, a few exams to be able to submit data. Um, this one's nice because you can start submitting data right away. That does mean that, you know, the, a federal agency or state agency might not use this data to say, like, definitively, this stream is impaired, but it does start providing some data because a thing that a lot of folks ask is, okay, what stream should I go to? And it's, the moral is go to any of them. There's over 3 million miles, I believe, of rivers and streams in the United States not all of them are monitored, not even half of them are. Um, so that's a big thing is just getting people out there. And even if the data that we collect, as you mentioned, you know, we're, we'll get some weird observations where it's like, I don't think you saw this um, bug or you, I, you know, in that stream, just even getting people interested in this, engaged in it and starting to crowdsource data makes a huge difference. 
All right, that was a great question. Awesome stuff. <laughs> and we do have, um, so we had a question and I'll kick this to you, Caroline, because you're plugged into so many different groups. Um, we have Paul asking, with the pandemic, are you seeing an increase or a decrease in citizen science participation Participation, and, you know, what are, what are you seeing amongst folks who are maybe stuck at home or not able to get out into the field as much as they'd like? There is definitely an increase. Oh my gosh, across the board, um, just on SciStarter, in the month of April compared to April of 2019, we had almost a 400% increase of people participating in SciStarter affiliate projects and joining projects that were listed on SciStarter. Um, and we were just absolutely blown away by that. Um, that being said, everything is so project specific, right? So even though we definitely see more participation in science, citizen science overall, um, there may be some projects that are negatively impacted. Like if there's a project, for example, where a key part of it is getting together in a group and you know doing some sort of analysis while you stand three feet apart, that project will be negatively impacted, right? <laughs> Whereas right. the project like salt vectors, more people than ever are participating because you can do it completely from your computer in the comfort of your own home and make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and we and another example of that, um, this is a quick anecdote. I don't know if any of you have ever tried these projects, but the Smithsonian Transcription Center, they are really cool projects where you um, basically transcribe um, historical records and are part of citizen science in that way. It's also kind of crowdsourced humanities at the same time, which is super cool. Um, you can also transcribe some old scientific records. They are running out of projects at a record rate, and that's a really great problem to have that so many people want to help them and do all these projects that they're really progressing through their data set. Um, so yes, more participation overall. However, projects that involve meeting in groups would be negatively impacted by COVID. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, we're, and we're definitely seeing that. So I actually had a couple of folks asking about, um, a couple of questions come in about Cree Critters. So the nice thing about Cree Critters, as I mentioned, is that it requires no training. We don't have to go out into the field and show people what to do. Um, you can just download it and go through it yourself. Um, but we've definitely seen with Save Our Streams, which of course is our more intensive, um, you know, we have to do field training because that requires a larger net. You have to learn the protocol and all that stuff. Um, you know, we're just kind of on hold right now. We're hoping, um, you know, later this year to start holding in-person trainings. But um, that is one of the tough things I think We've had to all think very creatively um, for ways to be able to keep folks engaged. Um, a nice thing about this time is there's been a lot of data analysis that we can do. You know, we've got, so Save Our Streams had its 50th year last year. Um, so we've got lots of data um, to go through as well, um, for sure. So then I'm going to ask Caroline, and this is something that we've encountered and even with you know, the programs I just talked about, they require, many of them require smartphone or computer or internet. Um, do you have, you know, anecdotes or thoughts about potential technology barriers for folks, you know, especially if you have people who might be um, a program who aren't, either aren't as comfortable with technology in terms of like using a smartphone or a tablet or whatever, or folks who might not have access to it. Um, do you have any, you know, like, anecdotes or ideas from some you know folks that you interact with in terms of how can you balance that for making an effective program oh my gosh 100 percent. i think data sheets are our friends um so i came into this firsthand where i was going to panama city florida after hurricane michael and i was going to do a program with um, students at the homeless shelter and after hurricane michael everyone in panama city florida basically had no access to internet and there was barely any cell service. Um, so I was originally planning to do a cell phone heavy project with these students. And I was like, oh, that'd be pretty tone deaf of me because they won't be able to submit their data after I leave. Um, so I pivoted to a project like the Great Sunflower Project um, that involves data sheets that you can use. And then you could submit your data later at, for example, a public library or something like that. So I think data sheets are definitely the way to go to make things accessible. Even if you still have people ultimately submit their data through an online form, giving them the option to take data or do the project um, offline first really goes a long way. And there are definitely, there are definite equity issues, I think, with internet and smartphones in general, because not everyone has them, even in the United States, especially. 
Um, so for those of you on the line who design citizen science projects, please just keep that in mind. And if you're open to it, um, please have a data sheet option for folks. Yeah, for sure. And you just uh, mentioned this, I, as it popped in my head as you were talking about in the US, but um, I was wondering sort of internationally, you know, for those of us who are on, you know, the citizen science listservs and whatnot, we know that there's lots of citizen science going on around the world, but do you have an idea of sort of how widespread citizen science is as a, as a movement? Is it something that, you know, is just really in Europe and America, or is it something that's, you know, is it, does it differ around the world or sort of what's the, what's the global culture of citizen science? There's citizen science on every continent, including Antarctica, um, which I think is fantastic. Um, and there are so many amazing international citizen science organizations like Citizen Science Asia. I think they are so cool. They do such amazing work. They've really um, taken the city nature challenge in Hong Kong, for example. They just really have done an amazing job year after year. So Citizen Science Asia, I really love keeping up with their journal as well. They put out really thoughtful pieces about citizen science. Um, so they're a great example. And there's also the, you know, the Australian Citizen Science Association. They do really phenomenal work. Um, and I, I know at SciStarter, we worked with them on a page after the wildfires in Australia. So citizen science was a way to like be empowering after the wildfires. But there are a number of Australian citizen science projects. One that we, um, ju that just became a SciStarter affiliate is called Quest a Game, um, where it's like a gamified biodiversity project, which is just such a blast for students especially and that is an Australian project that has gone international so that's another really cool one that pops into my head and for the Antarctica project I mentioned it's actually um, housed on a cruise line um, Hertigerton is the name of the cruise line um, where tourists who go to Antarctica can actually um, do research on phytoplankton and, and do some really serious citizen science on their cruise uh, while they're in Antarctica so I mean yeah, it's all over the world. It's in Asia, it's in Australia, it's in Antarctica, um, Europe, Africa. Oh my gosh, I, I almost forgot to mention, they, these people are absolutely phenomenal. The Unique Mappers Group in Nigeria, they have done so much work with stall catchers and other mapping projects, and they're also a really big inspiration to me. So yes, every continent, um, many countries, um, citizen science is definitely a global movement. Awesome. All right, well, I think if folks have any other questions that they want to send in, I'll keep an eye out, but otherwise we'll start wrapping up for now. Um, but Carolyn, I wanted to ask, so if someone is listening and they're, you know, at home in Minnesota and they want to start, they want to find out about a science project near them or what they can do to get involved, what should they do? Yes. Oh my gosh. Well, come to SciStarter, first of all, Stream Selfie is, a, if you've never done citizen science before, um, stream, stream Selfie is um, kind of my go-to first project recommendation because it's so user-friendly and you're able to, to do some really meaningful citizen science about water quality. Um, and there are so many projects that are global as well where you can participate online, like stall catchers. You can do that anywhere where you have internet access. Our, um, I mentioned the Great Sunflower Project earlier. If you don't have internet access most of the time, you know, maybe your internet's a little spotty or you don't have a smartphone, you can do the Great Sunflower Project and monitor pollinators with just a data sheet. Um, so yeah, just head over to SciStarter, use our project finder, do stream selfie, do creek critters. Um, you saw some great examples of projects you can get started with. And the main thing about citizen science is just to get started. Um, the projects you saw highlighted today, like Creek Critters and Stream Selfie, they have really clear instructions for you, so you don't have to worry about data quality, because if you follow the instructions, you're good to go. Um, and there are so many different projects to explore, and I hope that you enjoy um, learning. Great. Yeah, and as uh, Kelly mentioned, so I put up in the chat, you can just go to SciStarter and um, find projects that are in your area or find projects that are international, online, whatever. Um, suits your fancy. Um, and as well, there's many projects specifically with Save Our Streams that we do um, to help keep an eye on water quality. And I mean, essentially, the sky's the limit in terms of both if you want to get involved in a citizen science project and if you want to start a citizen science project, there's not really a limit to necessarily what you can do. I can look at, oh, sorry, <laughs> that word. Uh, what you can do, what you can look at. Um, and uh, it's really powerful. So there's definitely, there's also lots of 
Caroline cited a lot of great literature that's out there about citizen science um, and what, you know, the usability of the data and why it's why it's important. Um, and yeah, so I don't see any other questions coming in right now. So with that, I just want to thank you, Caroline, for taking uh, taking a few minutes to just talk to us about citizen science and um, all the different ways that we know that it's valuable, that it's usable, um, and some ideas about how folks can get started. And um, otherwise, as I mentioned, a recording of this will be available. And we have one more webinar next week um, that we have scheduled, which is actually about mobilizing and developing local local volunteer groups. So this will be a great one. Um, this is going to be presented by several of our Save Our Streams monitors who have um, local contingencies of volunteers that they've organized. So um, definitely keep an eye out for that if you're interested to sign up. And um, otherwise, Caroline, do you have any any starter sit sci event coming up on the plug? Uh, the biggest thing is I want you all to go to scistereo.org forward slash stream dash selfie. That's where you can <laughs> get find stream selfie today. Perfect. Um, and yeah, I'll see you next week, Rebecca. I'm looking forward to tuning into your webinar. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And otherwise, we hope to uh, hope to see your data soon. Bye, everybody.